Yeah, we are live. <laughs> and just like that, see, I have, a, I have magic powers. Today, we want to talk about boost, and we want to talk about more specifically how boost changes the power curve. So, how does it change the shape of the power curve? Meaning, where do we make peak horsepower? Where do we make peak torque? Does it do the same thing? You know, Richard always says, oh, it does the same thing under boost as it does NA. <laughs> well, guess what? It doesn't always do that. Uh, the answer is it depends. Um, actually, the answer isn't it depends. The answer is just both yes and no, depending on the different applications. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. Obviously, first of all, we'll jump right in and say, look, if you have, uh, we're talking about modular forward stuff because the thumbnail that I have up is a Kenny Bell, a 462 valve. Kenny Bell, I got a little visit from Bruno here, a 462 valve Kenny Bell blower kit that I ran long ago uh, doing testing on my 462 valve. It was actually a hybrid between a PI and a non-PI motor, so it worked out really good though, but we ran a Vortec on it and we ran a Kenny Bell, and one of the things that people ask is the following, hey Richard, is it? am I going to make peak power higher at a higher engine speed? Am I going to make peak power earlier, you know, what's what's going to happen when we add boost? What actually happens to the curve? Is it the same? So we got to talk about first on a turbo, it's going to be the same. <laughs> That's assuming it's really all, it has to do with several things. First of all, it has to do with what is the shape of your boost curve? So let's look at that. So if your boost is the same all the way through the RPM range where we test, if it's exactly the same, the shape of the curve is going to be exactly the same. It's just going to be better by whatever percentage of boost you're adding. So if you add half a bar of boost and you've done everything right, you're going to add 50% of power. The curve will be the same. It will just be 50% better everywhere from the beginning to the end, but it'll be exactly the same shape. That's, that's rare only because it's very hard to have the same boost everywhere. It's hard sometimes if you have a turbo, depending on how big it is and how much NA power you're making, especially power down low, sometimes it's hard to get the thing to make the same boost everywhere because do we have a boost curve that has to come up and then the wastegate has to start controlling it do we have problems with the wastegate controlling there there are a lot of other things that are that can come into play here and you can also tailor the boost curve to what you want a lot of times these fancy boost controllers can run versus rpm or other things you can regulate different boost curves and different gears and all kinds of things so you can affect that but that's going to dictate what happens with your power curve relative to the NA power curve. If you have no boost here at down low and you have lots of boost up top and you have a rising boost curve, then yeah, you can have, you can kind of shape the power curve how you want. But generally speaking on a turbo application, if we can run a consistent seven pounds or a consistent 10 pounds through the whole tested RPM range, you could get the turbo to come up. You could have the waste gate controlling it. It's making 10 pounds there and it's making 10 pounds all the way through and makes 10 pounds out of the top. The curve really is going to be the same. It's just going to be, like I said, more of everywhere. Now we need to look at two other applications. And the one is the photo, the thumbnail photo that I have up. That's the Kenny Bell supercharger. We need to look at that and also a Vortex supercharger. You can look at some other videos that I have up on the channel where we've run all the different kinds of force induction on one of them with a modular forward. In fact, it was a four valve though. We ran a roots blower, a twin screw blower, a centrifugal blower and twin turbos, although twin turbos and a single turbo don't really make any difference if you size them to do the same thing. But we ran all those different forms of force induction and you guys can see which how what the shapes of the power curves are. So we'll start off with a Kenny Bell and a Kenny Bell twin screw supercharger. And oddly enough, this has a change in the boost curve in the same way that a centrifugal does. It has a rising curve, despite the fact that the Kenny Bell doesn't have a rising curve. And if you're confused, I'm going to explain to you why that's actually happening. And the reason is, and this, this can be a very similar thing with a positive displacement, like a root style supercharger. The Kenny Bell is a twin screw, both positive displacement, but different designs. The twin screw tends to be a little bit more efficient than a standard roots blower does. But on a Kenny Bell supercharger, you have the you have the boost supplied by the blower, which is one thing. So the boost supplied by the blower is going to be a function of the speed of the blower relative to the engine, and then the airflow needs of the engine relative to the amount of airflow that the blower can supply. So if you can match all that up, the boost can be absolutely consistent all the way across the curve. That would be very rare for the blower to supply the exact amount of airflow that the motor needs um, because the amount of airflow that the motor needs to continually have that supercharger produce the same amount of pressure 
doesn't always happen. It didn't happen in our case. It didn't, it didn't do that when we ran this on the 462 valve. In fact, it had a, it actually had a slightly falling boost curve. So it started out like, at, for instance, on the Kenny Bell deal, we were running 10 pounds. It had 9.8 pounds at 3000 on the load in. It went up as high as 10.3 pounds. Not a lot that we're talking about a half pound variation, but then out at the top dropped down to 9.2 pounds out at 6,300 RPM. So as I said, one of the things that are going to happen here is your boost curve is going to help dictate what's happening to the power curve. So to give you an idea, when we ran this Kenny Bell, this thing raised where the motor made peak power by a pretty good bit. We didn't even rev it all the way out to where peak power would have continued to happen. But when the thing was NA, it made peak power at 6,000. With the supercharger on, it made peak power at 6,300, but was still climbing at 6,300. So it would have continued to climb despite the fact that it had a slightly falling boost curve. Now that would have leveled off at some point, but we saw a rising, we saw a rising or we increased where the motor made peak power, despite the fact that we had a slightly falling boost curve. Now the falling boost curve could have been a function of the throttle body size that we were using on that combination, which was, I think a 75 that we had on there. More throttle body would have been better. We certainly had enough supercharger. I could have looked to see if possibly we were running into maybe a belt slippage issue, although I don't think that that was it. But the reason that even though we had a slightly falling boost curve, the reason that we continued to make power at a higher and higher engine speed compared to the stock stuff, which has a long runner factory PI intake manifold, is that the Kenny Bell supercharger setup doesn't have that. It has a blower, it had an intercooler, and then it had a dedicated lower manifold that has short runners in it. So we know what short runners do, right? They lose power down low and then they gain power up top. And that's exactly what this thing wanted to do. The shorter runners wanted to make more power and run at a higher engine speed than the long runner PI manifold did. So subsequently, we have a motor now that wants to rev. Well, the upside of a positive displacement blower is that we weren't giving away a whole bunch of low speed power relative to the NA combination, certainly, because we had 10 pounds of boost. So 10 pounds of boost, even though we had a short runner, it still had a, you know, a more than ample amount of low speed torque. In fact, we were at 515 foot pounds of torque at 3000 RPM. So it was doing very well. So it made, it made really good power. And, and as I said, it had a good boost there and then a slightly falling boost curve. Hey, what are you doing? What's the matter, baby? Oh, do you need to go out? Is that what you need? Okay, just a minute. A slightly falling boost curve. And so the all of those things combined to give us the boost curve that happened with this combination. So it was the NA motor, the specific power curve of the NA motor, the change in intake manifold design because we had a shorter, shorter runner intake manifold, the airflow supplied by the blower, with, you know, given that combination of crank pulley and blower pulley and basically the rotor or the, yeah, rotor, there, they would be rotors, right? Yeah, the rotor RPM relative to the, you know, airflow needs of the motor help dictate what's going on there. So that's the, that's the positive displacement twin screw deal. And that's what happened with that one. On the centrifugal blower, something different happened. Um, it it, ha it also made peak power at a higher engine speed. Now we didn't rev this one high enough to actually reach wherever it wanted to make peak power, but you can get a pretty good idea. Um, we can take a look at the torque curve. So on running that same motor, running that same two valve motor with the PI intake manifold and a Vortec on it, it made, when it was NA, it made peak torque at 4,800. Well, with the Vortec on it, it made peak torque at 5,900. So we raised where the motor made peak torque by 1,100 RPM. So that gives you an idea of how much of a shift in the power curve we would make. And had we continued to run it out to where the thing would have continued to make peak horsepower at, um, it would have been much, much higher than factory. This thing made, it made peak horsepower at, at 6,000 RPM and would have made peak power much, much higher than that with a Vortec. Because the thing with the Vortec is even though it retained the long runner factory intake manifold, it also had a rising boost curve. So unlike the Kenny Bell that had a slightly falling boost curve on that particular application, again, probably because of that throttle body was a little on the small side. On the on the Vortec, we're blowing through the factory throttle or, or the 70 millimeter, 75 millimeter throttle body. We didn't have to worry about it. There wasn't a flow problem with that. We had long runner and the Vortec continues to make more boost and more airflow with more RPM 
So it just gets better and better as we go up in RPM. So that's exactly what happened. This thing just continued to, the boost continued to climb. The power would continue to climb. And the RPM where we made peak power would also continue to climb if we didn't get into some sort of belt slippage problem or some other kind of restriction with the Vortec. So those are three different situations where, you know, the combination ultimately is going to determine, hey, sweetie where the combination is going to determine, you know, what the shape of that ultimate power curve is going to be. And it's not just going to be boost. <laughs> so this is one of the misconceptions that a lot of people have. They, they, they're like, well, yeah, I had a boost to it. So, you know, it wants to rev or whatever. Maybe, <laughs> maybe it does that. Um, with turbos, not so much. So sometimes with a centrifugal blower or with a, with a uh, twin screw blower or roots blower, it can because it, has a, it also has a short runner intake manifold. But if we were to run that blower and use that, that uh, positive displacement blower and blow through a conventional long runner style intake manifold, we'd have a different result. But it would be, it's still, you know, all of that stuff is cool, but... I just don't want people to get the wrong idea about, oh, yeah, because they, they you, we see this a lot. Oh, you be quiet. Don't be sassy. <laughs> um, I don't want them to get the wrong idea that just because we've added boost, now the thing wants to you know run a lot of RPM. That's not necessarily the case. The boost itself usually isn't responsible for that unless we have a rising boost curve. So the curve itself is going to kind of dictate that. But modular forward stuff, I'm, I'm very excited about modular forward stuff and, and want to do more modular forward testing. I haven't run a modular forward in quite a while, and I really would like to get something back on the dyno so that we can do some more testing with it. And obviously a 4.62 valve big bang deal would be very, very important. And, and very much cool. I just need to get a set of ported two valve heads, um, you know, throw some cams in it, put a, put a different kind of intake manifold. But I'm sure somebody would like me to run something other than a PI intake manifold on a big bang deal, even though that PI intake manifold does very, very well in terms of average power production. But we would put something on there like a Victor Jr. or whatever the the Edelbrock version of that is some, some short runner thing that allow it to make more power, you know, on the big end and minimize power production down low. Cause we would do this with a turbo too, so that we could get some, you know, we could get lots and lots of power <laughs> before hopefully something came, before it breaks at 400 or, or 400 horsepower, right? Cause that's where all these modular two valve motors break is 400 horsepower. So let's see what you guys got going on today. Should we get through here? Let's see. I'm get a poll going. My dog wants to go out. Okay, who has run boost on their motor? Any kind. Turbo, blower, I don't care. Any kind of boost. Where are my boost people at? My boost peeps. Good evening. Thanks for the content. Thanks for being a Mythbuster. That would be, I would love to be on that show. Can you just individual cylinder timing and individual cylinder fuel with a Holly HP? Yes, you can. We have done that. I, I did that test. That video is up where we did individual cylinder trimming. Have you seen dimple head, heads before? Yes, I have seen them. Uh, would they be effective? I don't think so. Um, I think Eric has tested those and he tested the flow changes. I don't know if he tested the power at all or not. Kenny Bell is definitely fun on the street. I got to drive around my Mustang, my non-PI Mustang with a Kenny Bell on it. it made a big difference. <laughs> Variable pulley. Yeah, you could do that. That's hard to actually integrate, but it would be fun. We need some adapter plates to put a supercharger on a 543 valve. Okay, noted. For a thousand horsepower, is a Whipple simpler than a turbo? That just depends on what your ability is. Boost brakes, hearts, or parts, either way, it's good. <laughs> What's the best supercharger for the money for a 333 10 to 1, 450 N8 or each 750? I don't know what you mean by best. Uh, you got to be more descriptive than that. There's lots of superchargers that will do that. 
the 416 LS, how important are main studs at 15 pounds of boost? I've never run main studs in anything that we've done. Head studs, yes, but not main studs. And not for a thousand horsepower. Good afternoon. Good news. My new transmission from RPM showed up. Bad news. Debris in the road. Smoke the front end on my. Uh oh, what what kind of debris did you hit? Tuning my boosted bear yesterday. Very cool. Broke my diff on the dyno. Trying to run 30 psi. Wow. Do you plan on testing the M90 carbureted on the other guys 292? Uh, I'd like to put that. I would like to put an M90 on there. On the poll question, I've run a single turbo, twin turbo, twin twin screw blower. Never done a centrifugal though. It was going to, going to, but you talked me out of it. <laughs> They're good. They work good. In process in the process of installing an S480 on my 383 because the best motor to boost is the one that you have. It will definitely it will definitely take whatever motor you have and make it a lot better. Do a mini supercharger. I've done a few of those. I have one off of a mini. Oh, the the Mini Cooper that the M62. I have no idea. I couldn't find the debris. It was black and it was dark out. And it was raining. Was it part of those black helicopters that I hear so much about? My issue is the centrifugal is on is my engine it was being built to eleven and a half to one. Another productive day working on the Dodge fifty seven. Wagon, listening to Richard talk about boost. I have 03 boosted F-150, 4x4 with an 01 Lightning, 5.4 all stock. Oh, cool. So you swap the Lightning motor in there? What what computer are you using to run that? Have you ever thought about testing a 3500 or 3900 GMV6? I don't think I've run either one of those. I don't know if it was off a helicopter, but I got off easy. Same debris made an 18 wheeler undrivable. Uh oh, that's a pretty big chunk of something. Space debris. I don't know, baby. Why don't you lay down for a little bit? Okay, we'll go out in just a sec. Lay down, baby. Lay down. I know you're a good boy. I understand. I get it. I get it. I get it. No tuner close to me is why I never ran boost. Oh, there's that one. Huh? There you are. Hello. Hello, guys. I know. I know. I know. I'll come see you guys in a minute. Hello, doggies. Got my front bumper, the splitter, and all the covers and the stuff underneath is all tore up. Uh-oh. You guys want to come and say hi? Okay, come on. Come on up. Come on up. Say, say hello. <laughs> You want to come up, Brady? Come on, come on, come on. Okay, there's your brother. Okay, everybody's up. Oh, everybody's up. Who is that? Who's that guy right there? Who is that? Not who are those guys? Who is that? I know. I know, huh? Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> okay, 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 guys. Okay, okay. Lay down. Lower premium boost feels good. Yeah, it does. That's why. That's why we always recommend that. I got doggy nose prints. <laughs> <laughs> um the low speed boost and the you know that's why a responsive turbo and a a positive displacement blower that's why they always feel so good because more people are like just nailing the throttle for short bursts and having being able to do that is really really kind of cool um i remember doing testing with uh, jim bell from kenny bell and seeing if i could get my foot to the floor before the boost gauge would move and I, I never won. <laughs> dogs just check me out to order pizza. If if our dogs could order pizza, they definitely they definitely would. They do love pizza. In fact, whenever we go out and come home, they always look for the to go containers to see what we brought home. Do we? And Milo's the same way. He knows. He goes like, "Oh yeah, that's that's Merchant Maine. I know what that is. There's definitely some breadsticks in there. There's a pretzel. There's something. There's gonna be something good." 
Can you explain how to calculate dead time on fuel injectors and exactly what value Holly is asking for dead time or just front end dead time? I have no idea. I've never even dealt with that on the HP. I, I've never even, I don't even, I've never employed that at all. <laughs> That's what I say to my dogs. And they started looking at you <laughs> when they heard you. My dogs, whenever another dog comes up on TV, they jump up on the, on the counter thing where the TV is. They they love watching the dogs <laughs> and cats and anything that makes noise up there. They also like watching Spanish soccer for some reason. And they love David Attenborough where, whenever he's on. So they like watching Animal Planet stuff. How about ARP bolts versus ARP studs on a Turbo 416? L9 head guesses they need to know before using honing plates. The, there wouldn't be any difference between a bolt or a, or a stud as far as the honing goes. That wouldn't make any difference. But the I, I like to use studs, but either one of them will work for 15 pounds. Actually, either one of them will work for the power level you're going to get at 15 pounds. Let's say it that way. Who has run boost of any kind on their motor? 58% versus 42%. Now I feel sad. <laughs> the 42%, they need to experience boost once in your life. Boost is a good thing. Computers also from the 01 salvage yard degrees. Okay, so did you do the whole harness and everything on the on the um, lightning upgrade? They seem to run good. I read about a guy with a 3900 on the forums with a third gen Camaro running 1050 with a turbo. Yeah, you could. I, I could see how that could be possible. Um, you know. With turbo stuff, it's 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 a it's the big multiplier. Six pounds of boost on a three fifty one two valve Cleveland revs like a rotary. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Except it does something that a rotary doesn't do. It makes torque. Have confidence those people will run boost or get a kick build going in the future and not make the mistakes all of us made it, it's a lot easier if you don't make the mistakes if you learn from the mistakes of others and then you apply that when you're putting it together it's a lot funner when you put it together and everything works but you know then this is why i continue to have these live feeds is because there's still lots and lots of people that are putting big camshafts and short runner intakes and a good size turbo on a 4.8 or a 5.3 and they're wondering why for their street strip car they're wondering why it's not that much fun i mean it goes when it goes it goes but not having it be responsive as they want is a you know it's a better deal to have a small one i have boost for my mod motor getting around to installing it is another topic it does take time my 13b never delivered the goods in even was it a boosted 13b Michael, I agree. The 41% is they are missing. Oh, we've got 64%. Yes, now. So we, we're, we're, uh, we're getting better. Yes, it's only 36%. Yeah, boost is fun. I mean, even in the little sprint motor, it was awesome. John, you have a great dog. I have three of them, actually. And I hope you're able to go enjoy it for a while with them after the video, since I say how good the pub is. Hear something and speaks. Take it out for a good play session. I do. I we take them out. Um, our favorite thing is when when the weather gets better. Is we take them up in the hills hiking and stuff, and they just love getting out there. Does he want to run a Scat nine hundred crankshaft? And and if so, what horsepower did it handle? I don't. I don't have. I've never tried to max one out. But since we've run cast cranks at fifteen hundred horsepower, how much power are you trying to make with that? RX4 Coupe had a turbo. Very cool on the RX4. Thumbs up for that. But it never lasted. The road just don't make torque. Uh, Rob Dom's three rotor makes 620 foot pounds. Yeah, the bigger, you know, more, when you start stacking them together, when you've increased it by, I guess that would be 50%. That would be a lot. You made it 50% bigger. But boosted stuff can is is better. That's why a boosted rotary is so good because it, now it actually has much more average power production. Even on a small Euro turbo diesel, boost can be fun. Yeah, it's, it's especially on a diesel if you give it the requisite amount of fuel. 
lots of fuel, and then then the boost. If you just give a boost, it doesn't really do very much. What cam? A stock six liter LS with a nineteen hundred Magnuson. What what are you trying to achieve with said cam? Tell me what you want. There's no magic cam for that. There's no best cam for that. There's there's lots and lots of good choices depending on what you want to get done. Do you want to make all of the power at seven thousand RPM? Do you want to have a good driver, or you, do you want to use a stock converter? What is it you're trying to get done? And I'll, I can give you an idea on the camshaft. RPMs are what makes rotaries good. They do like to rev. I remember the little warning bell that went off <laughs> quite often in my friend's RX-7. Bing, 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 bing. Just wish rotaries would stay together. Was that really a problem with boosted rotaries? Or was it a problem with boosted rotaries and guys running too much boost on them? I do want, I really want a third gen RX-7. I like those very much a lot. And I want a cool like lime green one or yellow one or something. Red's also good. Pre-runner race truck turbo 400, 2500 to 6500. How, how heavy is the truck? I still think I would do a truck Norris or maybe a hot rod cam in that. I was under the impression that even stock 13Bs are pretty unreliable. Really? I I haven't heard that. Yeah, an FD price is not cheap. An 88 RX-7, but it wasn't a turbo model. It was a fun car, but doing the lawnmower premix thing got old. Don't, didn't they have... Didn't they have oil injection on them, like in through the carburetor or something? Doing my first boosted LS. I'm an old dude. Roots big block was my work for years. First aftermarket turbo and non diesel. So I have a ton of questions. Yeah, Gary. Uh, Gary, just ask us. Uh, let us know what your what your questions are. Fun daily. I had a R53 Mini Cooper factory supercharged. Cool. So the Cooper S, yeah. Thirteen B had nine and a half to one compression over nine pounds of boost is bad, even with water injection, even on a intercooled deal. And and did it have air <laughs> ARP headsets? Maybe maybe it had the maybe do I have a wrong cam? Maybe it had a maybe it had the wrong cam. <laughs> did, did it have a turbo cam? I tried to when we when we were trying to put the and run the supercharger on the truck. I tried to run the boost stain stuff. We were we were going to do a test when I thought it was an ideal test because we had uh, knock counts when we were running the motor before. We, yeah, before we put the blower on, we were um, we had knock counts, and so we because I had put eighty seven octane in it, and when I was driving down. And so I thought, okay, this is perfect. I'll put some of this um, boost stain stuff in there and we'll even put premium in it or whatever and try to mix those two. But the knock counts were still there because <laughs> the something is faulty in the system. Either the sensors are bad or the ground is bad or something else. Because we know that when we shut the knock sensors off that it ran the way that it's supposed to run. And we did that even with the 87 and it still ran fine. So it, it wasn't actually experiencing detonation. Um, so I was hoping that we were going to show, cause it, it would have been perfect on the chassis dyno to have not counts, cure the detonation issue with this octane booster. If it does that, which I think that it does, and then show that we've taken away the knock counts. That'd have been great, but that didn't, you know, sometimes testing doesn't turn out the way that you want it to turn out.
no inner cooler in 1986. Yeah. Let me clarify. I did all the mechanical work with a friend and a friend of mine did the computer work, did some wire manipulations. And next thing you know, we're fired up and running. Nice. Can all high HP go back and forth between E85 and pump gas without reprogramming? Uh, I think yes, with a, um, with a flex fuel sensor, I think it can do that. Yeah, Michael already answered that. I bought that car for $1,000, not running, put a fuel pump in it, which fixed it, drove it for a year, sold it for 1000 automatic NA with a beat-up interior. Cool. I have a wrist pin I kept for years. It punched a hole through my block after too much boost. Found it sitting on the side of the road. I want to add flex fuel sensor to both my cars. And Gary, I think that the Holly will run knock sensors. I haven't ever done that. So the the pin that launched itself through the block is the, is there you, is to serve as a reminder for you. I left my knock sensor wiring undone with the HP. We never run it on the engine dyno. We don't ever run them on the dyno. I mean on the on the engine dyno we don't ever run them on the chassis dyno we do, but I don't have an HP on my truck. We, we just it's it's just all stock. Pin serves as a reminder. You need to put it on a chain. You need to gold plate it and put it on a chain. Put it as the hand for a big clock. <laughs> you go, go all flavor flavor on it. That'll be a good reminder. Have a little alarm go off every time you start thinking about it. 64% are the boost people. I mean, else one that just developed a boost leak to the sump. That's, that's not a good place for a boost leak. Both my cars are stock computers, but definitely want to do flex fuel. Both my cars should gain pretty good on E85. If you got boosted cars, it's going to really like E85. That's less boost people than I, I would have thought would be in this chat. I, I agree. I kind of would have thought that there would be more, but would be a reasonable expectation for a stock bottom end ELQ4 with 862 heads, truck, Norris cam, long tubes. Also, would need bigger injectors for NA. Yeah, you do need bigger injectors. You're going to need to be able to supply enough fuel for a cam six liter, and then the heads are going to add compression, so you're going to add more power compared to a 317 head. I'm thinking that that's going to be in the mid 400 stuff, probably, for... 60 or 70, something like that. Uh, more boost viewers on the night stream. <laughs> so they come out at night. My plan is to go 85 all the way. And my current Turbo LS build, is, it, it is good stuff. Need a poll for people who have either the best cam or the wrong cam. Those are, those are really the same thing, right? Going to do an LQ9 conversion. Just waiting for the container from Miami. What what's coming in the container? Is it a? Did you buy something from a wrecking yard or something in from from Miami? And I sent off a lot of emails today. Oh, I got to talk to the guys at Deutsch Works. I'm in a big car group, and the only cars that are boosted are the factory ones. What about all? Aren't you the boost novice? Aren't you the guy that has the all the information on the Roush boosted modular Ford stuff? <laughs> if you didn't thumbs up on Dust video, do it now. That's right. We got 51 here and 34 thumbs up. <laughs> Tom. Tom knows the guy that has a blower on his truck. That would be Tom. And, and it was momentarily Richard also for several minutes. From the yard here, just low stock in Australia. Okay. Coolio. Yeah, 
Can't wait to see the Sprint get some boost. The the Metro, you mean? Sprint's a different thing. We stopped making stuff on this island many years ago. Australia's not making stuff anymore. Don't stop making all the pretty Australian girls with the with the amazing accents. Actually, Australians in general with amazing accents. I thought you had a Chevy Sprint. Did I miss something? No, I don't have a Chevy Sprint. I used to a long time ago, the one that got stolen, the one that I set the records in, but uh, I'm buying a Metro right now. Did you keep the M90 on the truck? No, the M90 is not on the truck anymore. It's all stock. Still shopping for a standalone electronic boost controller that can produce a rising curve with RPM. Doesn't the Turbo Smart one do that? Uh, Eric, I think that's overstating it just a little, <laughs> just a little bit. Call my turbos afterburners to nine car people with the turbo spools. Drive out of the boost and let it rip. Tell them that you put your afterburners on. Yeah, afterburners might go over some people's heads. But you've talked about a sprint motor. I had talked about a sprint motor. The sprint motor, the three, the one liter three cylinder in the sprint and the metro and the cultists and the firefly, it's all the same motor. Um, although they didn't offer the Sprint turbo motor in the Metro. So that's, that's, they're separated by that. Um, and then I do have two Sprint turbo motors that one of them will, at least one of them will go into a, into a Metro. Cause I want to go back to Bonneville. Yep. That's a setup. I have Roush ported Roush M90 with the bubbler delete. It's, it's, that's smart that you deleted the bubbler. Just put a cap in it or whatever. So real smart does it sort of. It's more for drag racing the way it works. I don't know why you can't integrate RPM with that. It seems like an easy signal for a computer to use. I figured out why the 90 didn't work on the truck. It's a problem with the truck, I'm certain. Um, I, I'm sure there's there are ground problems now because... I went out to try to start it and, and uh, the truck didn't want to start like the battery was dead and you just wheel stuff around and then it starts. So I know that there are grounding issues in it. Will the Holly Terminator Max do everything that you could need? Uh, I don't know. I don't know what the difference is between the specific difference between that and the HP and the Dominator stuff. I know one of them, the Dominator obviously has transmission control, but I don't know what it is you're trying to get done versus what the ability is. It'd be best just for you to go online and see what they list there and see if it does all the things that you want it to do. Is there much difference between air to water or air to air on the street car for lag or total power? No, the, I have tests where we've run both of those and, and from a performance standpoint, they both kind of do the same thing as an absolute deal. An air to water is better and it can be smaller because it's much more efficient because of the thermal mass. But while you're driving around normally, they'll both do what you want. The big thing is have an intercooler. And, and then a lot of times an air to air or an air to water, the choice is, is usage. What are you, what are you doing with it? And then on an air to air, the other thing you want to think about is if you're putting that up in front of your radiator, is that going to hurt the cooling through the radiator and stuff? So there's a few things to consider there. And unfortunately, there's not a clear, absolute best. <laughs> Can't put ice in your air to air. You can put ice on your air to air. But yeah, no, you, it, as an absolute thing, an air to water is will make more power. If you put ice water in it, you'll have much better cooling ultimately. But that's only a temporary thing. You can only do that for so long, which we do at Bonneville and guys do at drag racing. Not a good choice for obviously driving around on the street. Or for, you know, like road racing events, track events, the Silver State kind of thing, that that stuff, because you have an unlimited supply of airflow, really. Um, also, air to water, very good choice for a boat application because you have an unlimited source of cold water. So that, you know, again, application specific. 
How's our poll doing? 66%? Yes, now. <laughs> Hard to heat soak the ocean. Yeah, even a lake is. It doesn't have to be the ocean. Terminator X has no transmission control. Terminator X Max has transmission control. Okay. I don't think I've... I th I've used a Terminator X, I think, but not a Max one. Any chance of running a test on M90 on a 462 valve like an LS? Yes, there is a chance of that. <laughs> Rivers also work and, and very shallow ponds. Um, an M90 on a 462 valve is a good choice because of the the standard power output. Turbo Smart 2 does have RPM based boost. I thought that it did. I had my controller mixed up thing about the Turbo Smart as a price. Yeah, their stuff is really good, but it's priced accordingly. What's the safest boost for a stock 5.3 bottom end? Are you talking about one where you're not changing the ring gap? I would highly recommend that you change the ring gap. Once you change the ring gap, the highest boost that I've ever run on a stock bottom end 5.3 is 28 pounds. So eight pounds is certainly safe, but I would put ring gap in it. What about spray bars for air to air and have it activate when boost gets high? That can help. You can run CO2 through it. Some guys run nitrous through it. The, the testing that I did doesn't show a dramatic change in, in charge temperature when you use those, or at least when we, we use the one that we used. It didn't show a dramatic change. Um, I don't think that was an optimal setup the way that we had it. I, I honestly think you'd be better off spraying it and soaking it and making it cool and then doing a run and then also spraying it while it's happening, which we didn't do. I think that that would be better because one of the things like on an air to water is it's constantly circulating water. So it's constantly trying to cool things off and, and stabilize temperature. Um, whereas an air to air sitting there doesn't really do that. But that can help or, or you could spray guys do, uh, like a water injection setup, a mister in front of the air to air intercooler. And that helps it too. All of that stuff is, you know, is better. 28 PSI for how long? Yeah, we're not, we weren't trying to do it for a long time. I've seen you use turbo smart electronic boost controls before in your videos. Sounds like you've been happy with them. Can you remember which ones you use? Uh, you haven't seen me use that because I I've never used a turbo smart boost controller. I've used lots of their waste gates and lots of their blow-off valves, but never their controller. So I don't know. I've never tried that. We, we use the um, uh, TC1, and then now I think I'm just going to be using the Holly to control the, the little controller deal. A stock piston will, yeah, we've, we've made 1500 horsepower with stock pistons. So the level that uh, Chevy guys, so the level that you're talking about for a street motor, you'll, you won't have any problem at all. Would an M90 be able to keep up with a cam LQ4, LQ9? So far, one of those has made over 600. So it, <laughs> it would be able to keep up, but it's not going to help that much. I, I think once I've done everything that I can, that I I'm hoping to get to maybe 700 with a with a M90, but a highly modified one though. Um, and it might be that the and the one that I'm using are, are the ones from the 3800 V6. There are better M90s than that. The ones that uh, Boost Novice has mentioned many times that they use on the. Uh, Roush Mustangs, that M90 is completely different than the M90 that I'm using. Everything about it, the opening is different. I don't know if the rotor pack is any different. I haven't seen that, but the inlet's different. Um, the configuration going into actually going into the rotors is different. The discharge is dramatically different. It's just a better, it's a way better blower. So it, it will support more power, I'm sure, than the ones that I'm using. But also, that's not a $100 blower. Those, <laughs> those are going to be a lot more money. And if I was going to buy a blower like that, I would just buy a bigger blower and, and 
and especially for a six liter. Uh, 28 pounds on stock bottom end. We, well, we did 29, a little over 29 on the six liter. And that's essentially the same, the same bottom end. It's the same crankshaft, uh, same style rods and, and, you know, same pistons just has a bigger bore. So we did 29 and change on that one when we did the big bang deal that made 1500. And again, just if everything is right, it will do that. I want to run a Turbo Smart E gate on something. Where do we think dual M90s will land? Well, they can support twice as much power as a single. 416 will be this TA's 15th motor. Wow, that's a lot. First small block engine started with a 403 Oles. Lots of different ones. My wife wants to drive sometimes, but I'm a power guy, so I'm hoping for a 219-230. Okay. Have you used a dual plane, Holly dual plane intake on a 5.3? Yeah, we tested that many times. How did it perform? It's okay. I have videos up on that. I, in fact, I have videos up with those manifolds on the um, on the 5.3 L33. That video is up, with, I think, with different carburetors, too. Uh, how important is the tuner when running boost? Well, you want somebody that knows what they're doing. And I, I don't know about recommending a place because I don't know where you're at. A 219 cam, Gary, is pretty small for a 416. So that's that should be plenty drivable. And, and congratulations on your 15th motor. <laughs> that's a lot. 67% are in the yes running are, are the boost people. Okay, we're gonna switch over to live chat, see if I've missed anybody. I've run all of the single planes and dual planes and all, all of those. The carburetor intake manifolds never do as well as the EFI intake manifolds do. Um, but for a carbureted, you know, driver kind of street motor, dual plane is a good idea. With a stock gen card motor with ring gap and larger injectors, 800 horsepower. Yeah, you certainly can make that. The turbo is going to dictate how much power you make. So the if you're doing a 5.3, I would put a cam in it and springs. And then what most people do is take a 5.3, you're going to take it apart to put ring gap in it anyways. So put uh, I, I always put head gaskets on it, head studs. You're going to need bigger injectors and a bigger fuel pump because you have to have that for the power level. So bigger injectors, bigger fuel pump. Head gaskets, head studs. I put a cam and springs in it, like a, a mild cam, a truck Norris cam or something for a 5.3. And then, then 800 horsepower. The reliability will just be a function of your tune. As long as the tune's right, you can you can drive around like that. You're not going to be driving around at 800 horsepower. You're going to be using 800 horsepower when you can use 800 horsepower. And I can tell you right now, you're not going to be able to use 800 horsepower on the street. It, it's just going to, it's going to spin the tires a lot. I think questions about tuning should be how much do you trust the auto-tune functions on Holly? I don't ever do auto-tuning. I don't have it self-correct. I don't ever run it in closed loop when I'm doing stuff on the engine dial. You can. I mean, it, and it's for, uh, I, I, for, for drivability and stuff, that's a good idea. And as long as you could put in the, the things that you want there... Um, for air fuel, but that's only the air fuel part of it. You also have to do timing and then you have to do other things for the tuning part and the drivability part of it. The computer doesn't do that by itself. It does air fuel. <laughs> that's what it adjusts. We just broke the crank snout on a Whipple Coyote making 1200. I thought guys have made a lot more than that without hurting the crank. What power is usable in the streets in a thirty in a three thousand pound car? I don't know. It depends on how much it hooked up and stuff. My ninety eight Sierra is fifty six hundred pounds. Might need eight hundred horsepower all the time. Well, and if you have a heavy vehicle like that, 
I don't know if it's four wheel drive. The other thing you need to think about is 800 horsepower is pretty easy to get. It's really easy. But what transmission do you have in that? <laughs> Your transmission is not going to like 800 horsepower. It's not going to like 800 foot pounds of torque. Certainly it's, um, the drivetrain is going to be problematic and expensive for that. Wrote on a friend's red eye, rolling burnouts on the freeway. Yeah, that's a lot of power. Completely awesome to get useless on the street. Ring gap, a total seal, Molly, not gapless. I'm considering 22, 24. Are you sure Cleese isn't breaking stuff just for the views and new sponsors? I don't know if he breaks stuff on purpose, but he, he is, uh, I think, I, Tends to be hard on stuff because he's using it really hard. Auto tuning scares me. I have a few different downloads that I've had before I got an actual dyno and great tunes for my 335. There are spots where it run lean. And see it if it's if it's um if it's running closed loop and you have in the desired air fuel. It shouldn't do that. Just broke the snout off the LS2. Is he is he doing on off stuff that's a problem with the crank? <laughs> it's got a Corvette servo in it. That should make your 4060 work just fine, then, right? How much can a 4080 hold when it's stock? I don't know about a stock one. Does anybody know? Does anybody have any ideas, any input on that? Does anybody have any thoughts on that? <laughs> ah, yes. Yes, yes, yes. I'm excited about getting the, about running the blower on the truck. Just, it, it'll be fun. But the other thing I'm going to be doing is I'm doing a fuel mileage uh, test on it. So with the guys from Azir, uh, who I love, are they're fantastic. We've been using them obviously for decades now. Uh, I'm going to put an electric water pump on the truck and also an electric fan setup, and put both of those on there and see what kind of change in fuel mileage we get. So it'll be interesting. But I first obviously I have to fix whatever this this uh, ground problem is. <laughs> That's right. That's right. It's all about it's all about thoughts. Our thoughts and prayers. I talked to Chad today. We're trying to put together a date for the for the marathon. <laughs> We're gonna talk about lots of stuff. <laughs> talk about religion and politics and all kinds of stuff. It'll be fun. Getting really interested in a ZF. 8 horsepower 75 or 8 HP 90 swap. Boxes are fairly cheap and not easy to implement, but it can be done. Okay. Stock 4L80 is rated for 450 foot pounds. How much lower is the 4L60 rated for like 150 foot pounds? That <laughs> yeah, should be fun. It's all, you know, we're, we're all friends. The 330 foot pounds, that's that's a big difference. That's like a 50% upgrade. We're on a 4L80, 900 horsepower, 548 with a transgo shift kit. I like shift kits. No problem, still alive in a 350 pickup. Is the 548, is it a is it a big block Chevy or something? What is it? I didn't, uh, Sean, I didn't buy any extra neutrals. I, I couldn't afford all the extra neutrals in my 4L60. Although I did, in, in the original transmission, I did get I did get one or two, at least one. I, it'd be cool to do a, um, I, I just need to get a different truck. <laughs> I just wish I had a 4.8 a short bed manual trans truck. 
Mine held up to 280 horsepower just fine. I know that's how mine is too. Mine, I mine has a muffler on it. Transmission and Hellcat seem to hold up. Yeah, they definitely have been tested, but they nobody designed a Silverado transmission to hold a thousand horsepower because they was never going to make that much. The Hellcat is, and so they had to design it accordingly. But the Silverado is not that. 453 bore, 425 big block Chevy stroke. Oh, cool. That's a cool combo. 6L80 costs a lot more to build and has converter problems. I talked to the guys at um, GearStar. And Yank, I think, is the other guys that had that. that are, I think that that's the same company um, about doing a converter test. I kind of want to do a converter test on my truck. Um, the other thing I want to do is, if the people from Draggy are listening, you guys, if you guys send me a, send me a Draggy that I can use for testing, I would like to do that in my truck because I would like to do some acceleration runs with the stock converter. And it'd be interesting to see with the test that I want to do. And I know somebody's going to steal this because every time I talk about stuff some of the other people just run with it because they have the, <laughs> they have all the stuff that they need to get that done, <laughs> mostly money. Um, but I want to do a comparison of a converter versus a camshaft. So I want to see which one of those, um, you know, a, do, do a, do a stock one, tune it, do some acceleration runs and the chassis down and runs, put a camshaft in it, do the same thing, put a converter in it, do the same thing. And then see what, which one of those actually makes a bigger difference. Car owners waste one quart of motor oil per month due to frequent checking. <laughs> That's probably not a real thing. Wish we had a back-to-back -back boosted coyote with ported heads. What do you want? You want to know if what boost, what ported heads are worth on a boosted application? It'd be nice to have 456 or 488s on a larger tire, but with more ratios and shorter final drive. I, I don't I don't drink beer, so that's none of none of those sound good to me. We did ported heads on a coyote on a Gen One, and they picked up quite a bit of power. It, it was thirty five or something, so they're pretty good bit. That's pretty good bit of power. So it would have made more power under boost because it would have been multiplied by that. I have a mild LT4 hot cam in my Vortec 350 and just just picked up a 24 to 2800 stall. Nice. Australia's in the house. What's going on? Stock is... I, I, I read every comment, so... I don't know why I wouldn't do that. Stock 1700. Yeah, if you put more stall speed in it, it, it would be more likely to, to spin the tires. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of our pull at 66%. Believe it or not, I've got a four cylinder Camry. I change oil once a year and it uses no oil. LS guys don't have that. <laughs> Their oil usage is. It's definitely usage. And take a look at the inside of the intake manifold if you've ever taken one off. It's full of stuff. If you're going back over your 6.2 LS videos, I realize you want a 6.2. They do make good power. I mean, if you look at the LS3 stuff, it's it's nice. I'd like to see a Toyota SC14 versus an M90. Both blowers have similar displacement. I, I think that an SC14 is probably hard to find, though, isn't it? First converter was a Vega converter in a Grand Prix. 
It's just like the guys using the 4200 converters or the 48 converters or something, right? Aren't those higher stall speed in a in a 4.3? I mean, a 5.3? I swapped Gen 1 heads, reported Gen 2 heads. How, how do you, is that on a small box Chevy? Because how do you make that work? I wonder if, I, if the dry sump LS3, what LS3 has a dry sump on it? An LS7 has a dry sump on it. Price cost on a Ram 5.7 to LS 5.3 to make the same power? I have no idea. You'll have to tell me. My Fox uses a couple quarts of oil. So many 3,800s at the yard today. I was thinking about making a V36 out of 10 of them. That'd be good. Find some dolphins. They did. They watched. Um, what were we watching that was... Maybe killer whales or something. There was something that, that they were watching that was um and, and sharks too, maybe stingrays or something. They they like that stuff too. The Grand Sport LS3s came with dry sumps. Grand Sports ran the same LS7 dry sump. And 720 wheel horsepower on a 6L90 and swap the input shaft. Cool. Uh, Oliver, you don't, you don't need to do swap both of those things to find the answer to that. The, just swapping the heads already tells us that it tells us if the head has any effect, the cam has an effect on a, a, a going to a bigger cam will definitely have an effect on low speed power. We already know that. So the question is, does the head have a, have an effect? And on that note, it is time to go. Um, I, but I will be back tonight. In fact, it's now it's only <laughs> it's only a few hours. That's what happens when I get a late start. Thank you guys all for showing up. I will see you all later. Bam, bam, bam.